David uh, is a physician who specialized in interventional radiology. For those of you who don't know, right? Uh, radiology um, has a uh, actually actionable side. Yes. Is you're not yes. sitting in, in in the dark, sipping coffee, right. just saying, right. "Oh, I know what that is." Right. You're actually doing things. So he did interventional radiology. Um, he headed the. Um, he was the director of the body MRI and director of acute care imaging uh, for the Department of Radiology at UC San Diego. And then in 2017, you left and joined. Uh, HLI and yep. uh, recently became CEO. Correct. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Um, so I want to just start off um, uh, just for those who don't understand what uh, human longevity is, I yep. should say, or the company HLI is. Can you just give us a brief summary of, uh, of what you guys are doing? Yeah. And maybe what in, 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 intrigued you that you left and went, went to work with them? Yeah, all my colleagues at UC San Diego thought I was nuts for A, joining the company and then agreeing to be the CEO. But uh, it's been a, a wild ride and an awesome ride. Um, we, I, you know, I think the best way to describe what we do is just a little introduction on how we got where we are today. Uh, you know, the company was started four and a half years ago, and really the original intent of the company was to build upon, in the year 2000, of course, the sequencing of the first human genome. Uh, and, you know, as we know, uh, the clouds parted, the first human genome was sequenced, this was going to change medicine forever, and let's be frank, it really hasn't, uh, at least not clinically. Uh, so the company was started really to harness kind of the untapped power of the uh, human genome on an N of 1 basis. And so we, uh, in order to do that, we actually um, uh, decided to approach uh, genotype and phenotype both. And we set up a data gathering lab in the first floor of our company headquarters. And this was truly a science experiment. Basically, the idea was, let's uh, evaluate 50 healthy subjects with every possible test that we could do. So whole genome sequencing, whole body MR, 4D echo, microbiome, CT calcium scoring, neuropsychiatric testing. And the idea was to explore the normal human variation uh, in human phenotype as a way of better understanding our own genotype. And what we discovered as we evaluated these first 50 healthy subjects was that 40% of them weren't so healthy after all uh, and had a clinically significant finding, and then 15% had a clinically significant life-altering finding. Uh, and so... 40%. 40%, right? And these were folks who came in thinking they were healthy. So we... And this was everything from 1 in 50 with new high-grade tumors, 1 in 50 with new aortic or brain aneurysms, 40% with elevated liver fat, 20% with coronary artery calcium that they didn't know about. And then here's the crazy number, 1 in 4 with a rare monogenic or rare genetic mutation on whole genome sequencing that wasn't previously known. And we know these weren't just esoteric or academic findings because when we look at those rare monogenic variants or biallelic compound heterozygous mutations, we find that 63% of the time we're correlating those mutations with phenotype. So we find a male with a BRCA mutation and we're also finding prostate cancer on his prostate MR or we find an LMNA uh, gene encoding for cardiomyopathy, we look at the cardiac MRI and he or she has left ventricular hypertrophy. So we're making real life-altering, life-changing findings uh, in this precision health assessment. So long story short, you asked me what we do. We transformed that initial science experiment uh, into a precision health space uh, and transform the data collection into a data-driven precision health platform which we're now uh, democratizing and scaling. But in San Diego, uh, we have both sort of a precision health space and a data-driven precision health platform. So that's amazing. So because for years, people have been looking at how do you, how do you um, scan or look at people and give some kind of estimate of where their health is. Right. And people have talked, you know, there's certainly, whether it's colonoscopy or mammograms, people look at that and they are always worried about the specificity and the sensitivity of these things. So by pairing the genomics Correct. and the imaging and all these other sort of factors together, yeah. you've sort of scaled it down and perfected that. Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, it's a great point because I think one of the biggest risks to what we do, in fact, are sort of false positives. 
Uh, and I think we minimize those false positives by having a multimodal approach, right? So we're not just looking through imaging, we're not just looking at blood biomarkers, we're not just looking at genomics, we're integrating all that data together. If you think about prostate cancer, uh, really the field is moving towards using MRI um, as a diagnostic tool for prostate cancer, but as a radiologist myself, there's, you know, multiple instances where we have an equivocal finding, right? It's not cancer, it's not definitely not cancer, it's somewhere in between. Well, at that point, you can use genomics to decide what to do next, really to guide decision support. So if you have an equivocal uh, finding on prostate MR and someone has super high genetic risk, well, maybe you recommend biopsy. On the other hand, if you find an equivocal finding on prostate MR and there's very low genetic risk, you might just say, wait another year, we'll scan you then non-invasively. So, right, so you're really coming up with actionable items. Correct. Which is, which is important. So um, for those of you who have looked through the magazine, there is a great article in, 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 in the Startup Health magazine about health nucleus. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about health nucleus? Yes. So the, uh, the health nucleus is, uh, in fact, our precision health space uh, in San Diego. Uh, we've now had 3,000 clients uh, who have come through the health nucleus, and it's largely been word of mouth. Uh, we just hired our first chief commercial officer, but before that, uh, most of the clients came in were family and friends of folks who had uh, come in previously. Mm -hmm. I think that's a testament uh, to uh, the value of the testing that we do there and the number of uh, life-altering findings that we've made. Uh, but um, for the first you know, four years of the company, the health nucleus was the only uh, place in the country and really in the world where you could get whole genome sequencing married with whole body MRI and biomarkers married with uh, advanced blood biomarkers and putting that all together for uh, a sophisticated integrated risk profile. Uh, I'm happy to announce that our first uh, partnership now in Naples, Florida, uh, and second and third will be in Scottsdale and Los Angeles, where we're scaling uh, our data-driven precision health platform to multiple geographies. So uh, starting uh, January 1, just recently, uh, we're uh, alive and well in Naples, Florida. That's huge. That's yeah, huge. Thanks. Congratulations. So it sounds that, uh, that, that tests of that nature would be expensive. How is it um, that HLI is working with trying to bring the cost of that down, trying to sort of bring it to, to, you know, to the masses? Right. So we, um, you know, it's interesting because the first 3,000 clients that came through, uh, especially three years ago, our costs were significantly higher than they are now. Whole genome sequencing, to do a clinical whole genome three or four years ago, it was four or 5,000 bucks. Now we're under $1,000, and that's trending towards probably two or 300 uh, bucks in the next couple of years. So as our costs have come down, uh, so has our price point. Uh, you know, I like to say we're not so interested in millionaire or billionaire health, or the, those are the folks who came through and, and saw us initially, but really because our costs are coming down, uh, this is moving mainstream. Uh, and I estimate that in the next couple of years, we'll be able to offer the full assessment uh, south of 2,500. And I think as these costs continue to come down, uh, there's the potential to get at least parts of the platform uh, FDA approved and CMS potentially reimbursed, a third party payer reimbursed. And it, and it would seem the more patients you have, the more data you accrue, the stronger the, the, stronger the entire system becomes. It, it, it really is this, you know, virtuous positive uh, loop or positive feedback cycle where every patient who comes in is really informing uh, the next, very next patient who comes in. I think a highlight of what we do, you asked about false positives. Uh, you know, in a way, when I mention whole body MR, uh, many folks think of whole body CT that was done so many years ago back in the 80s and it was sort of pop, you know, um, proliferating like wildflowers. There were a lot of false positives with whole body CT. Uh, one, uh, CT is not nearly as specific uh, as MRI in the first place, and also it wasn't married with blood biomarkers or uh, genomic biomarkers. Uh, so uh, our goal is to really uh, you know, scale the entire precision health platform, not just components of it, not just the MRI, not just the genomics, and not just the blood biomarkers. Interesting. Is it, is, do, they, is, do the patients come back yearly, or is it an annual thing? Is it a... Biannual, is it five, every five years or? Yeah, so when we started, uh, it was essentially a baseline assessment and then actually by client demand, uh, we had a fair <clears throat> number of clients who want to come back and see us annually. Uh, so now about 20% of our clients come back. Uh, we re-annotate the uh, genomic data. So, you know, once your genome is sequenced, thankfully we don't have to do it again. Uh, so that uh, genomic data is there, but we're uh, constantly sort of re-annotating it, reiterating to identify new uh, 
uh, variants, uh, and we report those out every year. In addition, we repeat the uh, whole body MRI uh, and the blood uh, biomarkers as well. But I, you know, I think a part of the overall assessment is not necessarily the uh, qualitative assessment. So of course you're gonna go through and you're gonna get the radiologist looking at the imaging, uh, but really it's putting the uh, data together, uh, putting the uh, whole body biomarkers together with the genomic biomarkers, and actually giving our clients a readout on their risk for chronic age-related disease. So, and we actually started with Alzheimer's disease, uh, and we did that because in, in some ways it's the most challenging. We had so many of our clients who said, I don't want to know about my risk for Alzheimer's because there's nothing you can do about it, right? And, which is wrong. Uh, yeah. it's, it's wrong. We know that a third of the risk of, for Alzheimer's is due to modifiable risk factors. So cholesterol, blood pressure, visceral adipose tissue, liver fat, alcohol use, smoking history. So, you know, if you tell a 70-year-old to lose weight and lower their cholesterol, they'll tell you to buzz off. If you say, well, actually, based on all of your risk factors, all of your imaging, all of your genomic risk factors, we show that you have elevated risk for dementia, and the number one lever you can pull to mitigate that risk is to lower your cholesterol or to lower your BMI, that's a whole different conversation. Absolutely. And so that's the kind of data that we're enabling our clients with, essentially pre-symptomatic diagnosis. Right, and it really is a much more powerful tool when you say, if you don't, this is, yes. you have this high risk of this. And I don't want to, it's a shameless plug for uh, Dean Ornish, but we have Dean tomorrow who, um, you know, as you know, has done incredible work in the field of cardiovascular. Yes. But in his new book, they talk about how Alzheimer's um, might be modifiable by diet, exercise, lifestyle, Correct. and behavioral changes too. Yeah. So it really does uh, strike, strike, a, strike a point that these are modifiable uh, and things that we can improve just by changing some things. Yeah. And, you know, and I think it's really, you know, in a way, if you think about the last 30 years of, you know, of healthcare, it's largely been a, you know, clinical healthcare system sometimes supported by data. And I think we're finally moving to a point where, you know, uh, medicine is a data science supported by clinicians. And, you know, so many of us have heard about AI and how it's going to change uh, longevity, change healthcare. And I think this is an example of reducing AI to clinical practice, where we're taking not just whole body MR, but whole body MRI biomarkers, everything from left ventricular strain to estimates of regional brain atrophy to visceral adipose tissue, combining that with genomic data and really giving folks uh, a window into their risk for chronic age-related disease using AI algorithms. So in other words, not just like, you know, as a, you know, 46-year-old uh, white male, what is my risk for X or Y uh, disease? But, you know, based on everything I know about myself after having gone through the testing in the next year, my risk for coronary artery disease is X. And again, here's the number one lever I can pull to reduce it. So again, using AI machine learning uh, algorithms and applying those uh, on a clinical basis, we think sort of these multimodal integrated diagnostics uh, are the future uh, for pre-symptomatic diagnosis. Oh, that's amazing. So AI is playing a, a huge role in, 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 at HLI uh, also. Correct. So, okay. Yeah. Where do you think AI is going to go with radiology? That's a side note, just I always ask radiologists. Yeah, it's going re it, to replace us, right? right? You know, it's interesting. I, you know, if you ask most radiologists, uh, they don't think they're going to be, re, re, you know, be replaced by AI, of course, uh, but they do think that their ability to make an accurate diagnosis and to make that diagnosis faster is going to be enabled by AI, and I can't disagree with that. But what I would also say is that is just boring uh, and uninteresting to me because I think the real value of AI, and in fact the lowest hanging fruit for changing our healthcare system is not making radiologists more accurate, but it's actually answering the clinical question, you know? Yeah. If someone's referred for brain MRI for dementia, we don't just necessarily want to make the radiologist that much faster at the interpretation. We want to actually answer the clinical question. So put that MRI biomarker together with genomic data and actually answer the clinical question. What is this patient's risk for dementia? So, and I think that's really the interesting, you know, area for AI and radiology, not just making us faster. Yeah, that's neat. So um, I wanted to sort of end with uh, thinking, so you went from uh, obviously academic medicines, now you're in industry. Yes. Um, what is the David Carow mindset? Like what, what every day, what sort of mindset do you try to get into? What are you looking forward to in 2019 for both yourself, the company, yeah. and also healthcare? Yeah. Well, what I love about uh, what we do at Human Longevity, so I, as a clinician, I actually meet with a number of our clients and patients, 
And one of the greatest compliments I think that can be paid about what we do is I've had a number of clients who have said, well, you know, this platform of testing has been incorporated into my personal program. And you know, we all have our personal program for physical and mental and spiritual health. And I, and I would just argue that you don't really understand you know, your full uh, assessment of your own physical health until you undergo an assessment similar to what we're going on, you know, what you go through with the health nucleus. So part of what I'm most proud about is the idea that we have a significant uh, programmatic uh, component uh, for folks. And, and I like to say that you know, most of uh, human behavior and most of human disease is on a, a bell curve. Only a few of us have disease at the extremes and most of us are sort of in the middle. Uh, and in fact, I would just argue that most of us probably you know, treat, you know, treat disease, whether it's cholesterol, uh, hypertension, uh, depression, anxiety, you know, we probably need a program more than we need a pill. Uh, in general. And so uh, what I like is that we offer uh, a program uh, at HLI that allows people to, you know, again, understand their risk pre-symptomatically for chronic age-related disease. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you. I, I have to say, first off, impressed with everything that you guys are doing. I'm so thank excited you. about the future of what you are bringing to medicine. And I really do believe exactly like you said. I think that so much of what we need in healthcare is, uh, is transparency. And when I, when I say transparency, is transparency of what's going on within our own body and uh, being able to look at that and make changes, lifestyle yeah. changes, exercise, health, spiritual and, yeah. uh, and, yeah. and emotional changes. So thank yeah. you, We're, uh, I'm coming down. You should, yeah. thanks Howard. <laughs> All okay, right. Take care.